So we have to think about ownership as a, you know, within a, a volatility matrix that we can be big believers in, in a company and the opportunity set, but we have to recognize these swings, you know, to the upside and, and to the downside can be significant. You're listening to Traders Insight Radio by Interactive Brokers. Find more podcasts and daily market commentary at tradersinsight.news. Please remember any trading discussions are for information purposes only and are not intended to portray recommendations. Please listen to further disclosures at the end of today's episode. Now, welcome to our show. Let's get started. Hello, and welcome to IBKR Traders Insight Radio podcast. I'm Stephen Levine, Senior Market Analyst at Interactive Brokers, and I'll be your host for today's program. We'll be talking with Brendan O'Hearn, Chief Investment Officer at Crane Shares, about the impacts on and potential consequences to U.S. and global investors, as well as China and Chinese companies stemming from U.S. policy, namely the Holding Foreign Companies Accountable Act, or HFCAA. A little bit about Brendan. Brendan leads Crane Shares' research and education efforts. He actively works with investors on a wide range of subjects, from asset allocation to trading to providing insights into the growing influence that index providers hold in the asset management industry. He's also considered an expert in global financial markets with a particular focus on China. He's also the author of China Last Night, a daily commentary on China's financial markets, and we're very lucky to have him here with us. Welcome, Brendan. How are you? I'm doing great, Stephen. Yeah, very much uh, appreciate the opportunity to connect today. Yeah, it's great. It's really great to have you here. Thanks so much. And thanks so much for taking the time. From what I understand, the HFCAA was signed into law in late 2020. And about a year later, the SEC adopted its final amendments for its implementation. And there's been some mounting attention in the financial markets recently about changes that apparently need to take place for compliance reasons because of it. Uh, more specifically, I understand this involves certain U.S.-listed Chinese company equities that are on the cusp of being delisted from domestic exchanges, and I suppose, depending on their eligibility, moved over onto the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. Uh, some investors have now been converting their U.S.-listed ADRs, their Chinese ADRs, to local currency, the secondary listings in Hong Kong through their broker, and many have done this already here at IBKR. I know you've been very active in speaking out about this HFCAA issue. What can you tell us about it? Why did it come about? And how does it stand to affect these holders, whether it's single name Chinese ADRs, I believe there's a little more than 250 of these listed on US exchanges, uh, or through ETFs and, and other funds? You know, the kind of history behind this uh, goes back to the WorldCom and Enron uh, crises in the early 2000s, where following you know those frauds in the U.S. market, you know the Sarbanes Oxley was passed, and as part of Sarbanes Oxley was the formation of the PCAOB, Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, which was tasked with auditing auditors. So the idea was that they were uh, kind of the teacher of auditors. They would grade their papers. They would literally, you know, they received the audit papers. And over time, this law, uh, you know, the PCOB is in charge of was applied to foreign listings. And over the last 20 years, it's been a slow process of countries allowing these audit reviews to take place. And over the last decade, you know, the SEC and, and its equivalent, the CSRC, signed an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, that they would allow this for U.S. listed Chinese companies. But it, it really, really has dragged on where over uh, the last, say, two, three years, Belgium and France and China have been the last to sign on and 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 today it's solely China does not allow these audit reviews. That's that's really driven by a Chinese law that prevents the auditors from providing the audit papers. And following the Luckin Coffee fraud, the US the US politicians took it upon themselves to force the issue. So holding foreign companies accountable act was passed first in the Senate and then in the House and signed into law at the end of uh, December 2020, which says that if these audit reviews aren't allowed, then 
companies that don't allow it would be delisted from U.S. exchanges. And so you have over the last year, the SEC, you know, kind of clarifying how they're going to enforce this rule. And the the whole situation is is highly problematic. You know, the companies were allowed to list here. I mean, U.S. regulators allowed these companies and fully aware they could not adhere to Sarbanes-Oxley. And, and in some ways, the goalposts have been moved on the companies and their shareholders because you know, they're stuck between U.S. law now and Chinese law. And, and so the companies are in a really tough situation. And more importantly, their shareholders are in a very tough situation uh, because they're stuck between you know, the proverbial rock and the hard place on this issue. It's really fascinating. And I wonder what it is hindering China or, or what China's decision is not to comply, say, yeah. with the PCAOB, or what is driving that decision? I think one one would be that across the U.S. ADRs, you do have a small number of state-owned enterprises, so companies that have a higher level of government ownership from, from China. And within those state-owned enterprises, it's feasible that Within these audit papers, you'd see the subsidies given to the companies. Now, the state-owned enterprises make up a very, very small percentage of the overall companies listed here, of the numerically as well as from a market cap. The vast, vast majority of these companies are private companies. They have nothing to do with the Chinese government. So, you know, on some of the earnings calls of the companies, the companies in speaking to this have said, you know, we, we have nothing to hide. Uh, we would we would love to comply yeah. Yeah. to this, but we can't. You know, we're in China. We have to adhere to Chinese law. But now there's this U.S. law. The second factor is that this issue has been political sized. The regulatory bodies in the U.S. and in China really are out of the equation in solving this issue that, you know, U.S. politicians said, you're going to do this. And, you know, I've, I've got younger kids. And as a parent, I can say uh, no one likes to be told what to do, uh, but certainly not a sovereign nation from another country telling them. That yeah. is culturally something that is unpalatable, I think, from a Chinese cultural perspective. That's not how you operate in dealing with, with China and politically or in business. You know, I can speak to the latter. And it's it's ultimately, Stephen, you know, here's the real problem is that this was done to punish yep. China, but it that's an ill-founded view. Chinese investors do not hold the stock. U.S. and global investors do. And you're not hurting China if you delist them. You would hurt the investors, U.S. and globally, that own those stocks. Yeah, and we'll, we'll get to see how some of those stocks have, have performed uh, a little bit later. It's, it's interesting that you mentioned luck and coffee and fraud and how this HFCAA may have come about mm -hmm. on the heels of that. But I recall the political tensions, when you talk about political tensions, you know, I recall the U.S. government's efforts to crack down on Chinese policy related to technology transfer, intellectual property, innovation, uh, that they found, say, unreasonable or discriminatory or that burdened or restricted U.S. commerce. Uh, I seem to remember this affected Chinese tech stocks like Huawei and later uh, U.S. employed a section under, I think, the national defense law. I, I think it was section 1237, sought to essentially blacklist Chinese companies that the U.S. deemed to have ties to Chinese military. Uh, this included uh, Xiaomi at the time. Uh, and I believe it was under that same section led to the delistings of Chinese telecom companies from the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, now, is, is HFCAA an extension of these uh, U.S. policies as well? It is totally different that the you know there were executive orders in the waning days of the past and previous administration banning us investors from investing in companies that you know were reported to have ties to the chinese military as part of that ban that became an issue for us exchanges where 
three Chinese telecom companies, China Mobile, China Telecom, China Unicom, had ADRs listed on the exchange. And because that executive order was really pushed through in a very disorderly manner in a very short time period, those stocks were delisted by you know the New York Stock Exchange, which made yeah. investors who either didn't sell or convert their ADRs, ended up with a zero. Now, HFCAA is different in that we have a little bit of a longer window. You know, we're talking about maybe a later 2024, maybe 2025 delisting. So there's time to prepare for this. But unfortunately for investors who, in the case of China Mobile, Unicom and Telling, if they did not act, that was a zero. And unfortunately, you know, we've heard some, you know, really terrible stories about people whose parents were in the hospital or a gentleman who was transferring his brokerage account from one broker to another. Those that those positions are gone. That makes HFCAA a little bit scary in that if you don't act and this follows through, it's gone. It's it's a zero. Yeah. If you, by acting, you mean converting these ADRs to Correct. local currency, secondary listings on the Correct. Hong Kong. Now, are, are all of these ADRs eligible to be on this Hong Kong Stock Exchange? Well, we've seen we've seen over the last um, you know two plus years. A not, you know, many of these companies start this relisting. Actually, it actually pre uh, preceded HFCAA that. Um, Alibaba uh, relisted in November of 2019. So this this was well in advance of HFCAA. And the reason Alibaba relisted in Hong Kong was because U.S. investors treated Alibaba's <laughs> stock as like a trade war proxy. And so Alibaba said, well, U.S. investors don't understand us. So we're just going to go relist in Hong Kong where investors understand we have nothing to do with a trade war. And at the time, Alibaba's stock literally went from 200 to 300, that investors in Asia said, yeah, you've got nothing to do with it. So that started down a path of other companies relisting that you had JD and Netties relist in June of 2020, again, way in advance of HFCAA. You then had Yum China, but that relisting has really accelerated on because of HFCAA. And it's something that we anticipate across uh, 2022 is for very, you know, virtually all of these companies to relist. And Stephen, it's worth noting that the companies in many cases have moved their treasury stock out of the US ADR into the Hong Kong share class. So if you're the founder and CEO of like in many of the cases of these companies, they're moving their shares, which means they actually, you know, that they view this as, as a risk. And I think that's something that, you know, for us, for Crane shares, we've started this migration process within our exchange trading yeah. funds. Most, uh, most prominently KWeb, our, our China internet ETF, where we've, we've moved a third of, our Alibaba, JD, Netties, and Billy Billy positions into the Hong Kong. And we anticipate that that migration to to move further across this year, as well as other names that have relisted in Hong Kong. Uh, Bao Zun, uh, Weibo relisted recently, Auto Home, Trip.com. Yeah, yeah, they're moving. It, it, it sounds like they're really getting ahead of it. it it's, it's interesting you're bringing up risk. And I know with Chinese ADRs or really with any ADR, you have a foreign currency risk. It's an implied foreign currency risk. It's almost like an equity derivative in that sense, where the US dollar, the dollar value of the ADR is really going to fluctuate with the underlying currency. If you move these to local currency shares, I suppose that particular risk is taken out of the equation, which would be one less risk to consider, I suppose, among others that deal with ADRs. But there's also this idea that the Federal Reserve is now becoming a little bit more hawkish in terms of its policy of removing liquidity, of 
being less accommodative of hiking rates uh, in a rising inflationary environment. But the People's Bank of China, the Chinese Central Bank, seems to be becoming more accommodative. It seems to be going in the opposite direction. The I understand they're, they're coming under more scrutiny by Beijing. We used to have the Fed put. Now I hear talk in the markets of a Beijing put. I find that very interesting. So with these diverging monetary policies with the Fed and the People's Bank of China, do you think that given that it adds back a layer of foreign currency risk for those holders of the local market shares in, in Hong Kong? Yeah, yeah, it's a great observation, Stephen, you know, where the, you know, one, one underappreciated element of Hong Kong is that the Hong Kong dollar is pegged to the U.S. dollar. Now, it's not a one for one peg. Uh, it's allowed to float within a range, but the Hong Kong Monetary Authority does defend the peg. So yeah. in general, you know, Hong Kong listed stocks similar to, say, Saudi Arabia, which has a similar peg, you know, in this stronger dollar environment, the almost irony is that the Hong Kong listed securities have a measure of margin of safety relative to other EM currencies that, you know, the currencies float. And as the Fed moves to a higher interest rate, a tightening cycle, uh, that yeah, can be yeah. problematic for EM currencies. Yeah, yeah. And obviously you've seen that, you know, this, you know, over the last year, we'll say Turkey. Now you bring up another good point, which is it's, it's interesting that as the U S is moving to a tightening, China's the PBOC is actually doing the opposite that, you know, last July, the bank reserve requirement ratio. So the amount amount of money banks have to hold on their books was cut oh. by by 50 basis yep. points. And that frees up balance sheet to lend more. Uh, then in December, we had the loan, the one year loan prime rate cut. Uh, that was followed more recently by the medium term loan facility, kind of an intra PBOC, the bank lending facility that was cut. And then even more recently in, in January, we had the one in five year loan prime rates cut. So it's 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 interesting that you know China has kept its interest rates quite high. Over the last several years, they've not, they've actually haven't cut their interest rates in years and years. And so they've got this dry powder that they're starting to put into work. And I, I think that's mainly driven by the real engine of GDP in China has been export driven manufacturing that, you know, global stimulus has led consumers globally to buy more iPhones and TVs and laptops and computers and Sony PlayStations yeah. and, yeah. and cars. Now, for China as the world's factory, that puts tremendous demand on their exports. Now, as the U.S. and others move away from those stimulus policies, that export growth engine will inevitably slow. So, so China's got to make up for it elsewhere in their economy. So they're easing, and I think the consumption trends in China have been quite have been relatively weak over the last year because of their very draconian COVID measures. And they got to get those households away from that conservatives to start spending yeah. more. And, and so I think we'll see policies directed to the consumer, which, which should benefit you know, the companies within K-Web because a third of all retail sales flows through those companies that we hold today. It's really fascinating. And we've seen what the equity market in the U.S. has done or how it's performed over the span of accommodative monetary policy uh, in the U.S. It would be interesting to see how that plays out uh, in China as uh, the PBOC may become even more accommodative than it has uh, more recently. Which brings me to this point, which I think is really interesting because Chinese company shares haven't responded really well, at least since the F HFCAA had been rolled out. And I know you talked about how Alibaba shares had increased uh, relisting in Hong Kong, but it seems, you know, the ADRs, at least in the past year, shares in, in Alibaba, JD.com, which you mentioned, Baidu, Tencent, they've lost in the area between 40 to 60% of their value from their 52-week highs in that, in that time mm -hmm. period. 
But I also understand that there are certain related funds whose assets have actually increased their assets under management. So it seems that there's more inflows into related funds, even as these companies' shares decline. And so how do you explain this? Yeah, yeah. It's, um, you know, 2021 was really the perfect storm for U.S. listed China ADRs and, you know, just using our K-Web, which, you know, from 2019, the low in 2019 through mid-February of 2021, you know, K-Web went up like 170%. And then from that, we lost 50, you know, almost 50% over the calendar year 2021. Yeah. And it was driven by, you know, first we had Archegos, uh, you know, this U.S. listed hedge fund that five of the 10 securities it held were U.S. listed Chinese ADRs that were liquidated at at very, very steep discounts. We then had the onset of Chinese internet regulation which has really weighed on the space, you know, that it feels like they're walking down a list of companies, almost like an, an ad hoc or whack-a-mole. But, you know, the reality yeah. is the, the regulation is multifaceted. And those different regulatory silos like user data, user protection, fintech, anti-monopoly, anti-competitive, those different regulatory buckets are actually governed by different regulatory bodies in China that are have been moving at different speeds. And so as different regulatory agencies come out with regulation across last year, you know, we kind of view China as this singular entity, but that's that's not really the case. And then in the fall, as the SEC, which is, you know, really simply just the enforcement agent for a HFCAA. You know, they have to enforce this law. They've started to articulate how they'll go about it, which which I think, you know, really exacerbated uh, tax law selling in November and December in the securities that, you know, we've seen prominent, you know, if it's Elon Musk or Mark Zuckerberg, you know, if, if you're generating big gains, you're going to look for losses to offset those gains. And so, so, you know, I think a lot of investors where for in the case of K-Web over the last year, despite losing, you know, 50% of formants over the last year, we, we've had 8 billion of net inflow. So that's, that's investors saying, okay, A, I can maybe harvest a loss in an individual China ADR to offset gains elsewhere. But, but I think it's also elements of investors who don't want to hold a Hong Kong share class. And so they can use, you know, self-serving and highly biased, say, like a K-Web uh, to maintain exposure to the sector, but not have to hold a Hong Kong listing. Not all U.S. broker dealers allow an ADR conversion like Interactive does. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. That's really interesting. Can you tell me, what would you say to these holders in terms of strategy for hedging purposes? So they're holding the ADR, they're going to convert, you know, they want to make sure that they don't suffer any losses in the meantime, what would you suggest in terms of a hedging strategy or do they need one? Well, I, I think ultimately, you know, for any equity investor, you know, we, we are taking risk and, uh, you know, these securities are, you know, classified as emerging markets, which tends to have a standard deviation, a minimum of twice that of the S&P 500. So, so we have to think about ownership as a you know, within a, a volatility matrix that we can be big yep. believers in in a company and the opportunity set, but we have to recognize these swings, you know, to the upside and and to the downside can be significant. You know, I think as things migrate to Hong Kong, I've noticed that the Hong Kong names are not nearly as volatile as the US names, in my opinion. I haven't proven this quantitatively. But I do think that in Asia, the the Western media narrative about China, you know, it's it's not that investors aren't aware of the you know that negative narrative. They just don't buy into it, you know. And I think about Evergrande, you know, in the U.S. or Western media, it's you know it's China's Lehman moment, and in China, no yeah. one believes yeah. Evergrande's going to default. Uh, it's just too big to fail. I, I mean, I, I don't think Evergrande exists in three to five years. It'll be unwound, broken up. Yeah. But 
an outright default? No, no. Like it's 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 not just that there's 120 banks have lent money to Evergrande. It's Chinese households have paid for an apartment Evergrande is building. And a default means they get left holding the bag. You know, that's not going to happen. Yep. It's highly unlikely. It won't play out like a like the real estate crisis or the housing crisis here in the U.S., uh, although that was uh, really seems to have been a uh, phenomenon of mispricing credit, I think, in general. But in mm -hmm. this case, we have a, a huge company, a huge lender, where the real estate market is very much tied to uh, that particular company and that particular company defaulting. The government, you're saying, won't allow this company to default, to default because it's too big to fail in their eyes. Yeah, I mean, you can, I mean, you know, you can never say never, but, you know, I would say in Chinese financial media, there's little to no belief that Evergrande will have an outright default. There's just too many, you know, Chinese households because it's a national size company. You've got people all over China have paid for an apartment. They want that apartment. And and then think about all of the construction companies working on Evergrande's projects. You know, that electrician, that plumber, you know, the person yeah, running yeah. the cement mixer, they want to get paid. And all the raw materials and all the investors in those raw materials as well that goes into it, right? I mean, there's there are a lot of parts to it. Stephen, 100%, you have a downstream effect. And that's that's not even, you know, who do they owe this $300 billion to? You know, it's yeah. Chinese banks. So, you know, in yep. general, you know, Evergrande will pay for its sin, uh, 100%. But I don't see an outright default uh, taking place. Well, this is, this is great. And I'm sure that that's great news for the banks as well to hear that and to hear you say that. I'm going to wrap this up <laughs> a bit here, Brendan, but I'd like to hear your insights on what you foresee for U.S.-China relations going forward as a result of the HFCAA and what we started this conversation with. Will these delistings, do you think, pose further risks for the markets in the U.S. and financial markets globally? Does it splinter out from here? Yeah, it's, you know, you know, A, you know, I think it's, it's, it's misguided to think this hurts China, that it, it hurts U.S. investors. Uh, secondarily, this is capital controls. And capital yeah. controls for political purposes is, is a very slippery slope. It sets a very dangerous precedent and puts U.S. capital markets at risk for global investors. They would say, look what, look what happened to China. That can happen elsewhere. But I do think this issue is solvable, that, you know, despite, you know, the rocky political relationship between the U.S. and China, this is not a hard one. This is solvable. And, you know, hopefully that there are discussions taking place to solve this issue. You know, unfortunately, it's taken the U.S. a year to assign an ambassador to China. So you got to have dialogue and communication. I mean, get on an airplane. It's 2022. Yeah. You know, you're not sending a telex or a fax. You know, this isn't like Carthage versus Athens <laughs> or Rome, you know, uh, Athens versus Sparta or you know Rome versus Carthage, you know it's 2022. Get on an airplane. Yeah, and you're and, and you're talking about political will, and uh, that's really what it sounds like it comes down to, in terms of resolving this issue. But this was truly fascinating, Brendan. I mean, thank you very very much for taking the time to do this. You can learn more about this topic for our listeners in Crane Share's webinar presentation, U.S. to Hong Kong Stock Conversion. It can be found on Crane Share's website. Uh, you can also keep abreast of Crane Share's webinars at ibkrwebinars.com, as well as their market commentary at IBKR Traders Insight at tradersinsight.news. And I hope you'll be back with us again, Brendan. Yeah, I would love to, Stephen. You know, thank you very much. You know, I think it's uh, for your listeners. You know, as a fiduciary, we're we're not going to stand idle on behalf of our shareholders and. At the same time, you know, we feel it's it's a obligation to make you you know investors aware of this risk. Um, and I commend Interactive Brokers for providing a venue to allow for this ADR conversion. You know, not not all U.S. broker dealers allow that. Uh, so a hat tip to um, Interactive Brokers. Uh, thanks again, Brendan. I, I really appreciate it. And until next time, I'm Stephen Levine with Interactive Brokers. Thanks for listening to Traders Insight Radio. As always, there's more content at tradersinsight.news. And if you're interested in learning more about interactive brokers, visit ibkr.com.
We offer more trading education materials such as webinars at ibkrwebinars.com, market-related courses at tradersacademy.online, and quant-related articles at ibkrquant.com. There's a substantial risk of loss in foreign exchange trading. The settlement date of foreign exchange trades can vary due to time zone differences in bank holidays. The interest rate on borrowed funds must be considered when computing the cost of trades across multiple markets. Interactive Brokers is not affiliated with and does not endorse or recommend any third-party investment information advice services or products discussed in this episode. The analysis in this material is provided for information only and is not and should not be construed as an offer to sell or the solicitation of an offer to buy any security. To the extent that this material discusses general market activity, industry, or sector trends, or other broad-based economic or political conditions, it should not be construed as research or investment advice. To the extent that it includes references to specific securities, commodities, currencies, or other instruments, those references do not constitute a recommendation by IBKR to buy, sell, or hold such investments. The material does not and is not intended to take into account the particular financial conditions, investment objectives, or requirements of individual customers. Before acting on this material, you should consider whether it is suitable for your particular circumstances and, if necessary, seek professional advice.